Hey everyone, here we go. Season three, we're kicking it off. Welcome to another round of the Resilient Pastor Podcast. And once again, the big change up is we get to welcome two co-hosts alongside me in this show. We've got Rich Pelotis and Sharon Hottie Miller. Welcome guys. Yes, Hi. yes, yes. Great to be here, Glenn. <laughs> I love it. One of the things I love about you guys is um, your love, or maybe it's Sharon's love for Disney, and Rich, maybe it's your <laughs> wife's love for Disney. I mean, uh, what, what's the Disney connection here, Sharon? You were just out here with us at Rock Harbor, and you snuck in a Disney day. Yeah, well, it's funny. I was there, and I had just been texting with Rosie because she said that y'all are going to Disneyland when you go out there. Yes. But... Glenn said, so is Ike as into Disney? My husband, he said, is, is Ike as into Disney as you are? And I said, you know, I haven't talked to Rich and Rosie about this. And so I might be misrepresenting you, Rich, but Ike is kind of, it's like a friendly hostage situation a little bit. Like he, <laughs> he, he likes Disney. He likes Disney and he loves me. And so he, he likes going to Disney, but if he had married somebody else, would he go to Disney that much? Yeah. No, he would not. <laughs> and so I kind of get the sense that maybe it's similar, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, there, there has been a slow unfolding of love for all things Disney <laughs> And it did not start that way. And, you know, I went on one vacation as a kid growing up. And so I never went to Disney until about a decade ago. And then Rosie became a travel agent with Disney and all that. And so um, I actually, I've become not just a lover of it, but it's, I'm really bougie about it as well, too. And so uh, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. <laughs> Uh, I'm so right. glad to I... hear that because when I I went so I went to Disney after I'm not kidding you after I preached at Glenn's church I literally Ubered to Disneyland and I went by myself <laughs> and the number of people who who commended me like you go girl like way to go way to not be insecure about being at Disneyland by yourself and it actually felt like kind of a backhanded compliment and so I'm actually excited that that we can like share this this affection for Disney absolutely you know what's funny I so I I grew up in Malaysia like the the vacation of my childhood was when my parents said to my sister and I we are flying to America and we're going to Disneyland I mean it was like the most epic thing ever so to live 15 minutes away from it now is pretty cool but also it's like my secret weapon in trying to get guest speakers you know so it's like come on do you want to speak at Harbor? <laughs> and do you want to go to Disney nice. you know uh, this is great. Okay. Hey, today, you know, our listeners are going to hear a conversation that I have with Tim Mackey from the Bible Project. This is a hard pivot right here from <laughs> Disney to Bible Project, but, but I'm going for it. Um, but, but Tim and I, we covered a lot of different ground, but one of the things I was just, I just wondered what you guys, how you wrestle with this, but like, how, how do you, um, make sure that you're reading the Bible for your own sort of delight in it? Or is it just hard? Like you just end up reading the Bible and you're like, oh my gosh, there's a sermon from this passage here, even if you're not reading it for a sermon. Mm. I mean, for me, I, I have two, there's two kinds of ways that I think about this. The, the, the first is uh, that it is a big danger to go to scripture in a utilitarian way as a preacher, as a pastor, as a Christian who just wants to get a word maybe for someone else. And it's no longer about communion. It's about how can I get something out of this to do something with it? And so on, on one level, I think like the devotional reading of scripture in relation to how I think about reading scripture for pastoring and preaching, I think we'd have to be mindful of that. But I also think um, that the devotional reading of scripture for me um, needs to really emerge and, and the fruit of that is the message that I'm preaching. And so I just, yeah, I, it's yeah. fine. I find it really interesting that people can read for preaching, but not have their lives saturated in the text that they're in in that particular week. And for me, there's just like a significant mm. and severe disconnect uh, in those two kinds of ways mm. of uh, reading scripture. Yeah, I actually agree completely. And I I realize this can vary depending on your season of life, your season of ministry. But for me, the majority, I would say, of my sermon preparation is 
for me. And Mm -hmm. I am coming to the text and asking, where does this resonate in my own soul, Mm -hmm. you know, or or answering questions that I have about the text or looking like, where is, is the beauty? Or we, we spent a whole year in first Samuel and there's some really Mm -hmm. hard texts in first Samuel. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I experienced in that season was, you know, there, there's passages that you approach and you look out almost like you're looking at this wasteland and thinking, mm. surely there's no water here. But mm. knowing that, that if you dig deep enough, you are going to find water. And if you do that enough, you start to trust that it's going to happen. And so I love that, that journey of coming to especially hard passages and thinking, it looks like there's no water here. But I know if I keep digging, I know if I keep mm. wrestling with God, I'm going to mine like a treasure. Mm. And so I love that. I actually, my favorite part of preaching is the preparation process because it's such an intimate experience with God. And I know that if I can come away captivated in some way, then I am going to honor this passage and communicate it, like do it justice much more when I'm preaching it as well. You know, there was this guy when, when I was at New Life in Colorado, there was this guy who came and walked, helped our church when we were going through this real crisis times 16, 17 years ago. And every time he would come to meet with us, he would say, I read in my quiet time this morning. And he would share like the most perfect insight uh, for us, you know, which is, we used to call it his magic Bible reading plan. Like how does God like his magic Bible reading plan? But that is, there. <laughs> there is something there about like, you know, you, you reread the text of the sermon. So it messes with you and you get insight on it. So that, like you said, Sharon, but then also, in our normal devotional reading, things do come out of it, right? That that we end up using. You guys mm-hmm. uh, like like share in a staff meeting or something like something you read that morning. Yeah. Well, can I ask you guys a question? So, your yeah. kids, I think Rich, your kids are a little bit older than mine, and then Glenn, your kids are a lot older. Yeah, Thirteen than, and eight. Yeah. And so, one question mm-hmm. I have for you guys, because I don't want to, I don't want to be putting on airs like. You know, I just shared this this majestic scene of me preparing. It's like me and the Holy Spirit. But our our house is, you know, a dumpster fire a lot of times. And so it's hard to, as much as I love, you know, preparing for scripture, a lot of my time outside of that is much more there unpredictable. Like there, it's hard to have a rhythm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I was just curious for pastors who have younger children, if you have, like myself, if you have any, any habits, anything that you learned that was helpful in that season of ministry? I mean, uh, no, you know, (laughs) this feels in some ways like whenever I give (laughs) advice to new parents, they're like, what advice do you have? My first advice is don't listen to anyone. All right. Um, you know, you know what you're going to do. You're going to be okay. And so in, in a similar way, I think there, I think there are seasons where I have greater times of regularity. For example, every time I come home from a monastery, you can be sure for the next two and a half weeks, boy, my rhythms are amazing. And and then, you know, I don't know what, I can't find my Bible after that, you know, but uh, so I think there are just seasons where yeah. uh, these things happen. And I think the most important thing is um, to have lots of self-compassion mm-hmm. for these moments because yeah. it can yeah. be crushing if we're not living up to whatever standards we set for ourselves. It's so true. I, I have a chair in, in a room in the house that I'm like, this is my Bible reading chair. But like maybe one day of the week, I sit in that chair and read the Bible, you know? Uh, so a, a lot of times, honestly, like a lot of times what what happens is if I have some drive time, I'll play from the audio Bible and have it read. But like when I'm trying to pray the Psalms, like I'm in a season now where I'm trying to pray the Psalms again, I'll like make sure that it repeats that same Psalm like two or three times. So I'm listening to it over and over and over again. Or sometimes it's immersive, like I wanted to get a, a pano view of like, you know, John's gospel or whatever. So like listen to the whole thing while, you, while you're, you know, out on a walk or, you know, so there are, there, those are some of the ways that it isn't monastic. It's just so funny, Rich, because when Sharon's like saying that her house is a dumpster fire, I was going to say, yeah, we don't live in a monastery. And then you follow with, when I return <laughs> from a monastery. <laughs> Well, it's only two weeks after that, Glenn. I mean, so I have a two-week good run, and then after that, it's it's a dumpster fire again. That's great. 
<laughs> okay, so so we got our own kind of Bible reading stuff, and that is, yeah, there there's there's some rhythms that we're trying to get in with that. But how how like as pastors, how do you help people, the people you're pastoring, you know, engage with the scripture themselves? What are some of the things you guys have done? You know, for me, Glenn, I when I think about helping people get into the scriptures and world of the Bible, uh, I think we have to help them come to it with, with uh, in reality. Uh, Thomas Merton, in his book, Opening the Bible, it's a little book, about 90 pages. I find it so helpful. Uh, he says that the Bible is without question one of the most unsatisfying books ever written, at least until the reader has come to terms with it in a very special way. And there's so many other books that, if we're going to be honest, will captivate you and keep you or your attention a lot longer than the Bible. I mean, if you try reading Leviticus, good luck. Uh, but um, <laughs> I still, number one, come to it with, uh, you know, with some realism. Uh, but I also think, I mean, I try to help people in community uh, and in small bite-sized things. I think the story of Scripture that comes to mind is... Jesus feeding the thousands with a little bread and a little bit of fish, and that a little bit can go a mm -hmm. long way in the mm -hmm. presence of God. And so we don't have to read everything at all at once, but little by little can go a long way. I like that a lot. Sharon, what about you? I mean, you guys, you and Ike, you guys do anything to help, you know, the people engage in scripture and stuff like the church? You know, it's Rich's answer is so interesting because it points to the paradox of scripture because on the one hand you're absolutely right there are aspects of the bible that are boring there are aspects of the bible that are weird and there it's it can be feel very inaccessible mm -hmm. and yet it will absolutely change your life Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that also points to the importance of knowing your people mm -hmm. and where are they and what are they yeah. needing? Because one thing that I think our people, mm. and, and I, I'd be curious, Rich, if, if you experienced this as well, like we, we are in the Bible belt, but we're in a very progressive area. And so people know the Bible, and, and maybe that's something is, that is different with your context. People know the Bible, but that is a hindrance to them. Like they think they know the Bible. And so a big part of our work is re-enchanting people yeah. with the text, if that yeah. makes sense. And like yeah. recaptivating them with the beauty of scripture. And so yeah. I see my job as, and this really informs my philosophy of preaching is kind of standing up on Sundays and almost like lifting up the lid of the mm. treasure chest a little bit, just enough for mm. them to be dazzled. Mm. And I'm hoping I'm sort of wetting their appetite. And obviously mm. that, that re-enchantment that, you know, feeding that desire has to be then buttressed with with habits and with practices. But that's so, it's just funny how different our answers are. And because you're like, the Bible is boring, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's no, absolutely I'm... true. And we have to be realistic about that. But also the Bible is, is beautiful and yeah. amazing. And those are both true. And depending on like who you're discipling, where your starting point is, is, is going to be different. Yeah. I like the idea of discipling. It's funny, Sharon, like I'm, I'm in an area in the West Coast can tend to be sort of more secular. Orange County has got a lot of churches, a lot of Christians. But the Bible saturation thing is so connected to information and study and memorization. And so one of the things for me just pastorally is getting people to pray the Bible, even in these mm -hmm. pastoral appointments, you know, so you're sitting down with people and talking with them about their life and what's going on. But but then instead of just saying okay well great here's a little bit of advice or here, but to say hey what 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 do we open a passage of scripture together let's read to it together let's let's pray through it together and almost that becoming a form of discipleship man we could go on for a long time on this we got to get to this conversation I had a great convo with Tim Mackey uh, one of the places we didn't even get to explore here uh, but I think Tim and I get into a little bit is just even the role of technology like does technology help or hinder 
our engagement with the Bible? Is it is it obviously it can be a, a good thing, can be a tricky thing. But hey, before we get into that convo with Tim, I want to just say a word of thanks to some of our partners that we're working with on this initiative. World Vision cares deeply about this generation of emerging leaders that God has raised up for this season to mobilize his church. That's why World Vision and Barna have partnered for a very special webcast, Engaging Gen Z, why there's hope for the next generation and the church. You can get free access today at worldvision.org slash resilience pod. And we want to thank Full Strength Network. Full Strength created a well-being membership specifically for pastors and ministry leaders. They provide access to coaching and counseling experts, well-being resources, and a community focused on living healthy lives. Learn more or join now at fullstrength.org. Well, Tim Mackey, what a delight to have you on the show today. Welcome to the Resilient Pastor Podcast. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. It's good to be here talking with you. Tim, you spent a lot of time uh, in academic settings, obviously teaching, but also studying, doing your own uh, PhD work, grad school work. But you've also spent a lot of time in the church. You've been in pastoral ministry. And so I'm just curious, um, how do you think about the connection between the church and the academy? Mm. Hmm. Well, man... At the hand, we don't have enough time. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, I mean, we could talk about ideally, we could talk about reality. Yeah. Um, uh, there's many, uh, there's many ways. Uh, so maybe here's something interesting. If yeah. we just think historically, and by mm. historically, I mean 2,000 years, you know, since the mm. Jesus movement began. Um, you know, uh, in the first centuries, um, academic learning was just about training people to lead networks of house churches, yeah. you know, or an, or a house church community yeah. um, in those first few centuries. And really, you know, the first Christian schools or educational centers, the mm-hmm. biggest one was in Alexandria and one up mm-hmm. in Antioch. And these were just for training people for the lit- how to lead people in Christian liturgy and pr- teach them to pray and read the scriptures. And there you go. I mean, I, ideally, yeah. that's been what it's about. It's become a lot more than that and a lot more disconnected than that. But I think it's essentially what's so rad about the Jesus movement is that it came to birth mm. as a messianic Jewish movement mm. with so much rich intellectual history and heritage to yeah. it yeah. in Judaism. And so it's all about uh, poetry mm. and texts. Mm. and um, liturgy, and song, and worship, and gathering, and Mm. communal life. And all of that doesn't just happen by itself. It happens because humans think well about how to live together and cultivate a shared life. And I think at its best, theological education has just been a think tank Mm. to engage scripture, engage our traditions, and reimagine with the Spirit what the Jesus movement can look like in all the different places where it goes. But we live in a time where it's become a lot more complicated <laughs> than that. So anyhow. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you mentioned the word professionalization, which, uh, you know, on the subject of the Bible, which you've given your life to helping everyone kind of understand the Bible, move the Bible outside of only the professionals being able to handle it. But Tim, how do you how do you think about that line between the technical skills required to understand the Bible better, mm. um, and that instinct on the other side? Maybe it's not on the other mm. side, but that instinct that says, "Well, the Bible's supposed to be for everybody and not just the professionals." Yet mm. it requires some sort of professionally acquired skills, if you will. Um, mm. How do you how do you think about that line or that tension? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, it's hard to separate it from my own experience. Yeah. Um, so I, I have been following Jesus about a year um, in my early 20s. I was 20. And um, I had just started following Jesus through an outreach ministry to skateboarders. Um, so a church actually built a skateboard park in its back yeah. lot. Yeah. And uh, so I, anyway, so I, but it was across the street from a Christian college. Um, that had a whole major in Bible. And so um, I started volunteering at the skate park and was asked to lead a Bible study for junior high skateboarders. Wow. And I was like, I, 
I don't know anything. I can tell my story and I can tell you what I'm learning about how awesome Jesus is, but I don't know about the rest of this book. And so um, I was, I remember sitting in my first classes, how to study the Bible. And I was just blown away about, I was just everything. I just thought it was the coolest stuff in the world. Um, and so I just started getting simple tools, not nothing to do with Greek or Hebrew, just mm. like learning to recognize literary styles mm. in the Bible and the different expectations, learning how to trace repeated words, mm. um, learning how to follow, this is going to sound elementary, but I almost failed at high school, uh, learning how to follow the, an argument and yeah. a coherent line of thought, like in Paul's letters, where he develops a line of thought, like just basic skills that you, you don't need to know anything about Greek or Hebrew. Hmm. So in that sense, and again, this goes back to the history of Christianity. It's yeah. always been a movement hmm. that has been teaching people to read and yeah. teaching people to think hmm. and to hmm. level hmm. up from wherever they're at beginning at. And so in that sense, education has always been a part of uh, the, the Jesus movement at its best. Hmm. And so in that sense, like we all can increase our skills yeah. and it's just a part of becoming a, a mature human is learning new things. Yeah, I love that. B however, the Bible is also like, um, uh, pick your music genre, mm -hmm. like classic jazz, you know, or classical music. And I'm not a, I, like, I'm not a music historian. Actually, I took my wife uh, to the Oregon Symphony huh. recently. I don't do that very often. And um, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was, they were doing um, Tchaikovsky. Um, mm -hmm. And I say that like I know very much. I, sure, I and I'm nodding Wikipedia. along. I'm nodding along. I, like I know exactly. <laughs> I oh, yes, of course. Yeah. I read the Wikipedia article before we went, just so I like knew who this guy was. But like I could tell, like I it was moving and beautiful, yeah. an incredible experience. But I was sitting across from some a couple, and they were so like just they were so into it, moving their bodies, and they were having a much deeper level of experience, you know, than I was, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and. Um, and so take that as like a metaphor, I guess, that the Bible is a kind of literature mm. that you can know hardly anything mm. and have a very powerful experience and gain some new skills and have a more powerful experience. Mm. But you can also be 25 years in and know the languages and have gained a lot more skills and you'll experience it at a yet deeper level. But mm. it's not like it's inaccessible you know, to, to people at, at just at the beginning. And, and that has been my own journey and it's the journey of millions of people too. Tim, I really like that metaphor a lot because you could even keep pressing into it and say, and then if you really, you know, want to go beyond learning, say the story behind a Tchaikovsky, you know, composition mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, maybe you find a, a piano piece and you learn how to play the piano yeah. and you learn how to play yeah. that piece and you're, you're imitating that great piece of art, which yep. is, which is sort of, um, you know, what we're meant to do with scripture. So I, I'm curious, Tim, like, like, what was the impulse for you when you guys were starting the Bible Project? I mean, what was your hope for Christians? What is your hope for Christians as, as it mm. comes to engaging mm. the Bible? Mm. Yeah, um, again, it's hard to uh, separate it from my own personal yeah, story. But, but my, tell, my, yeah. enc my encounter with Jesus as it was as a young man um, who grew up here in Portland and skateboard subculture. Um, I had nothing going on in my life. <laughs> uh, it, and um, my brain was so clouded from years of smoking too much pot that I just, for me, when I met Jesus, I was so compelled just by who, he, who the stories about him and how he treated people. And then I saw my friends who were skateboarders who followed him mm -hmm. and their, just their lives were so compelling to me and so different than the friends that I was partying with. Mm. And so in that sense, it was just a very personal, emotional, relational encounter mm. with followers of Jesus and then Jesus himself through the scriptures. And so, and then I sat in those classes, you know, just trying to, fit, and I just fell in love. Mm. So my encounter with the scripture has been one of delight, mm. of continuing deepening delight from day one. Mm. And um, I have come to learn, and I did come to learn, that that is not everyone's experience with the Bible. <laughs> and so um, really it's, I've, but once you light that yes. 
ignition yes. of excitement yes. to see that this is not what you think it is. Yeah. This is actually some of the most profound, beautiful literature you'll ever encounter. Mm. It will keep on giving as much as you keep investing, mm. and it will say things that you have never thought to think before. Mm. That's consistently is my experience over you know, more than two decades now. Mm. And so just to light that fire, to help somebody have that first moment where they're like, oh, this is not what I thought it was. Mm. And if, it's just that right there. Because yeah. once you ignite that, you can't stop a human being who is curious and is excited, you know? It's beautiful. So, of course, there are other things about facts in the Bible or things <laughs> about it, and that's helpful too, but it's really about that spark of curious excitement yeah. that is the thing that um, we're hoping to ignite in people. Well, it is it is absolutely what you and the team at Bible Project do so well, Tim. I mean, just to take a moment here and just to affirm that, I mean, the the videos, the way that you connect meta narratives and themes and threads, that absolutely lights the fire, you, you know, for me and I know for, for many, many, many others. <laughs> I, I want to ask you again, maybe from your own personal um, experience from pastoring and sermon prep and Bible mm -hmm. reading, um, how that all worked together. But but to set that question up, um, when Barna asked pastors how often they mm. kind of did their own personal Bible reading other than, you know, as a prep for sermons, mm. uh, a little over half, so 55% said, yeah, yeah, daily. I read my Bible daily apart from sermon prep. And then about 27% said, mm, if I'm honest, it's more like a few times a week. And then two out of five pastors, so about 42%, said that one of their greatest spiritual concerns was teaching others to read and understand the Bible. Talk mm. to me about your own experience as you were in pastoral work and prepping mm. sermons. How, did you ever struggle with that, like sort of reading the Bible, mm. but thinking, oh, okay, here's what I can get out of it, you know, here's mm. what I can kind of, here's the sermon mm. from this, you know? Yeah, well, yes, uh, to a degree, Um I don't know. I think the only reason I ended up teaching the Bible for my job was just because I loved it so much. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's great. And so, uh, again, I know that's not everybody's experience, but mm -hmm. um, it was mine. Mm -hmm. And so it was always what I did ask the leaders at our church community was if if I could have half a day a week mm -hmm. to just cultivate my own learning interests related to the Bible, but mm -hmm. apart from anything that I might give a sermon on. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a pretty significant half, half of a day. Um, but they said yes. Mm -hmm. And because I tried to convince them that like uh, my, the way I work is um, my, my, most, my most creative thinking is going to come out of some overflow that isn't just mm -hmm. like an instrumental engagement with the Bible. Right. Um, but there were times when that ebbed and flowed, you know, or mm -hmm. waxed or waned, pick a mm -hmm. metaphor, and... <laughs> So but I really resonate with that with mm. that tension. I, I think for me, an equally and related tension was teaching the Bible so much that what I was the ideas that I was teaching about often outpaced my own personal growth or character yeah. growth in those yeah, particular yeah. areas. And mm. so like I'm teaching about all of these ideas or ideals. Mm. Um and it's like, I just can't keep my, can't personally keep up. Hmm. Like I need to either stop and just like work out the stuff I taught over the last year, hmm. <laughs> but it's the next, anyway, you get what I'm saying. So that was another yeah, that's, dynamic too. That's very real for people yeah. in Bible teaching ministries is that yeah. disconnect hmm. between character growth and your, the growth intellectually. We'll get back to our conversation in just a second. But first, I want to take time to thank one of our incredible sponsors, World Vision. Make sure to check out the webcast that World Vision hosted with Barna about engaging Gen Z and raising up the next generation of leaders in the church. You'll hear from Gen Z themselves along with pastors and leaders on how to engage today's generation and make an impact on those to come. Go to worldvision.org slash resilientpod now for free access. We also want to thank Full Strength Network. Pastors and ministry leaders are often so focused on helping others that they don't take time to take care of themselves. At Full Strength, they understand these challenges and they want to help. So they've created a well-being membership specifically for pastors and ministry leaders. This membership provides access to coaching and counseling experts 
well-being resources, and a community focused on living healthy lives. Their vision is to see pastors and ministry leaders thrive in personal well-being and lead the church to impact the world. Learn more or join now at fullstrength.org. And now back to my conversation. You know, you named a couple of things there, Tim, that I just want to make sure our listeners catch. You 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 named the space to sort of almost creatively, non-pragmatically, um, just mm. reading the Bible. You, you talked about it yeah. sparking your own delight and 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 yeah, um, or, or reading biblical scholars yeah. Yeah. or theologians. Yeah. That's just books unrelated. I'm not trying to get anything out of yes, it. I just yes. am excited to learn about this set yes. of ideas and theology or the Bible, and maybe yeah. it'll go into a sermon one day, but that's not the purpose. But but that's a really practical thing, Tim, that not a lot of pastors feel like or maybe think mm-hmm. to uh, ask for, you know, to, to sort of say, yeah. hey, hey, could I? But it's absolutely replenishing the well. I mean, all the different leadership yeah. bo- books or whatever, Stephen Covey called it sharpening the saw, you know, years ago. Yeah. But that that idea of 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 going making sure that it's that it's fresh and that it's you know there and then the other thing um um that that you mentioned was um uh, not letting your output or your preaching sort of outpace your character or your content prep outpace your character which is a really interesting thing because there again is the connection mm-hmm. between uh, there is an information part of our own spiritual growth but there's certainly a, a, a transform transformational mm-hmm. sort of element to this Mm-hmm. And again, if the Bi- if the Bible becomes an exchange of ideas, then mm-hmm. then we ourselves are are not allowing ourselves to be changed by it. So, just want to I, I think mm-hmm. that's really really important for for people to um, mm-hmm. to listen to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, go ahead. You want to comment on that? Well, uh, yeah, I think for me the most instrumental well, instrumental to use that word <laughs> maybe too much uh, a really important way that I've found traction to move towards that and become more integrated was one, uh, this sounds silly, but with COVID, you know, especially here on the West Coast in in a city like Portland. um, So most churches, you know, went dispersed and uh, weren't meeting in person. And so Mm -hmm. really re-engaging when churches started gathering again, my whole family, my wife, my two sons in a local church with friends and we're, we're, we're actually like being at the church. <laughs> um, so in, in other words, in relationships where I have an eye on my friends' lives and they have an eye on, I, I have their eyes on mine and I've invited them to point things out in mm. my life where mm. there's that mm. disintegration. And and the other part was seeing a spiritual director, which mm. I know is very common in some Christian traditions, yeah. Yeah. but um, there's an organization here in Portland that I had some friends who are pastors were seeing a spiritual director. And it's just been huge, inviting a person to, I, I was asking them, I'm actually compensating them yeah, yeah. <laughs> to uh, cultivate this friendship for the purpose of them looking into my life mm. and asking anything they want. And mm. they do. And that's mm. their job. And it's just been really important for me to have someone like that in my life. Because you're often, when you're in ministry leadership, especially if you're really knowledgeable about the Bible, people assume like you've got your whole life together. <laughs> yeah, you're living this stuff, right? Uh, and yeah. uh, of course, that's you know not not always the case. And so, having someone who can ask you anything and that's mm. their role in your life mm. uh, is has been really important for that's me good. in moving towards those issues. That's really good, Tim. I want to switch for a little bit and talk about Bible engagement. Um, you know, when Barnett did some of this work on Bible engagement, this was mm. uh, February 2023, so pretty recent. Mm. They mm. found that one in three U.S. adults said that they read they 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 had read the Bible in the last seven days outside of church or outside of a religious service. Uh, so, oh, really? We're, one we're in talking, three? Well, one in three uh, had had engaged wow. the Bible in the last week, out, other wow. than apart apart from a church that's service. A lot that's higher that, than I would think. Is it okay? See, it's interesting. I, I I'm like, man, that's a bummer. And you're like, oh, hey, wow. that's, <laughs> that's great. Okay, I live in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, yeah, so no, like... I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and but but here's okay, maybe one that's kind of positive. If three out of five U.S. adults, so this is not just Christians, but th- you know, mm. t- three out of five mm. say that they have mm. a positive opinion of the Bible. Mm. So there's some openness, okay, mm-hmm. you know. Um, mm-hmm. And then, and then for practicing Christians, it's two thirds. So for practicing mm. Christians, two thirds said they'd read the Bible in the last week, uh, uh, other mm. than in church. So that, mm. that's great. 
Um, the, the Bible Project is brilliant. I mean, there's so much about it theologically, artistically. Uh, for, for those listening that maybe have seen a couple of YouTube videos here and there, but are not sure how to leverage the full gamut of what you guys offer, what can we d- be doing as <clears throat> pastors or church leaders to help our churches, help mm. our congregation kind of mm. leverage these resources, if you will, if I can put it that way, uh, mm-hmm. to engage in the Bible more frequently? What, what, is it the mm. app? Is it, is it the podcast? What, what, what mm. would you say we would need to, to start with? Yeah, you know, um, we haven't, uh, on the whole, done a very good job or intentionally tried to package things sure. um, for certain contexts. Mm. Um, our approach has mostly just been make a ton of content that both is visually really engaging and aesthetically Mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's, you know, as distilled, thoughtful, creative communication about the Bible as we can. Um, And then just let people do what is good in their eyes. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So, uh, you know, podcasts um, can be a way to community build if you invite a friend to listen Mm -hmm. to it and then you can talk about it together. You can do that same with videos. Um, but mostly what we hear is about ministry leaders who are doing things. And yeah. we're like, oh, that's awesome. Do more <laughs> of that. Or maybe share that. and um, Or we'd love to share that with some part of our audience. So mm-hmm. um, very often, like we'll get uh, like a, uh, a youth leader team will reach out to us and say, hey, we took this series of videos like on spiritual beings mm-hmm. or on the five word studies on the Shema, the mm-hmm. prayer um, in Deuteronomy um, chapter six and say, we turned into this and then we created discussion questions and stuff for home group leaders for all of our like high school students to go through. So stuff Mm -hmm. like that, people make their own essentially curriculum. Um, another tool is our our real hope is that people watch a video and they have a little moment they're like, that's in the Bible or whoa, like that's cool. I'd never heard that quite that way before. And then they want to go read the Bible. That's Mm. the goal, to Mm. get people to Mm. actually read and encounter Jesus through the Bible. So Mm. um, we have a really key partnership with the Bible app, Mm -hmm. just the Bible in the Mm. App Store by YouVersion. And so they have lots of reading plans. You can sign up for 30-day, five-day reading plan, one year through the Bible. And so we have tons of reading plans that have multi-day Bible reading experiences with videos and mm. questions mm. well all woven in. Mm. It's a big, long, five days, seven days a year, whatever. So that's a practical way to, is to do a reading plan with a group. So you're doing it individually, but you could easily turn that into a group experience. Mm. And then, uh, I don't know, for pastors, I, I, think, I think some pastors play videos as parts of yeah. sermons, especially our short ones. But um, yeah, and we've we've used them as like um, additional resources to go alongside a series. You know, we did you know we did a series on Ephesians or whatever, and we're like, hey, here's mm. the Bible Project mm-hmm. video on Ephesians. Mm-hmm. Um, take take some time and watch that alongside. So it, it, it's it's really wonderful sort of additional structure resource, um, and 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 small groups do it as you mentioned. You know, to to yeah. say, hey, uh, we want to track along with Sundays, and we're this yeah. is the book that we're in, so let's watch this yeah. playlist of videos or whatever. Our hesitancy mm. in packaging things mm. is the way that you would package or shape something for a youth group in Portland is really different than you'd sure. do it for a youth group in Georgia sure. or Tanzania or, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, to, and so I, it's more out of a hesitancy, like we don't presume to know mm. w- what's the best way for this content to engage any given church. Mm. Um, but we are thinking about it more and yeah. thinking about ways that we could, um, help organize things a, a bit more to set yeah. ministry leaders up for success. I love that. You know, some some of the newer um, Barna stuff on Gen Z and the Bible is uh, for, for Gen Z who own a, or use a Bible and are Christians, hmm. 30, 33% have used the internet to, to or, you know, reading the Bible online or 21% hmm. are using an app, which is honestly yeah. maybe not as high as, as I might yeah. have expected because these are supposedly the digital natives. But like in in your mind, is there a love hate relationship with the tech the technology interface here? Like, are, is, mm. is the goal to kind of okay watch a video but then open up your paper Bible, or is it like, man, as long as you're getting into the Bible, I really don't care what the medium is. Yeah. I mean, how do you yeah. how do you think about that? Yeah. Um. Well, technology is come and go. Mm. I guess mm. This will sound as a surprise, but even paper Bibles 
are just one of the technologies <laughs> that has been used in the history of the Bible. Mm. So originally, all of these texts were on either scrolls or uh, parchments. Mm -hmm. And primarily, especially the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, was designed for memorization and oral performance. Mm -hmm. So that, I, I really, these are crafted to be orally performed and memorized mm -hmm. so that you do a Psalm 1, mm -hmm. which when we read on uh, his God's law, he meditates day and night. The word meditate means literally to pronounce out loud to oneself, hmm. to recite. Hmm. Um, so the biblical literature is designed to be heard hmm. and to be recited. Hmm. And that's the original technology has nothing to do with paper. That's great. That's great. <laughs> and the, even the scrolls that it was on were visual prompts for the, the reciting process. Mm -hmm. So even our paper Bibles are a technology that mm -hmm. offers some benefits, but also some, some downsides mm -hmm. too. Um, and so I, that's kind of how I think about, you know, uh, digital technology. An advantage that digital technology has um, is that you can create interactive mm -hmm. um, forms of experience with the Bible in ways that just a print paper Bible can't. Mm. Um, but on the flip side, um, the things that people are going to interact with most are these, yeah. which are like <laughs> ruining all of us, you know, <laughs> right. I, and also giving us a ba great benefit too. Yes, so it's yes, like, yes. it's really, yeah. every technology has its, um, strengths and weaknesses yeah, yeah. and how do we, how do we mitigate those? So I don't, we're not like, we don't create videos with cliffhangers on the end that's like get you to watch the next one and manipulate you to <laughs> right, keep watching right. for hours. Right. Um, but uh, we are trying to use it because it's it's the marketplace. Yes. We're like Jesus going to the well yes. in Samaria. It's where people are. Yes. And it's a place where you can get people connected to Jesus and the scriptures. And there you go. I love that. Well, Tim, I could talk for hours with you, but I know we got to wrap this up. And I wonder if you would just um, take a minute here and and pray for our listeners. One of our hopes with this podcast mm. is that people, you know, they, that it sparks some ideas and it helps them to, to be mm. equipped for the challenges that we're facing today. But at the end, we, we really, at the end of it all, we really are hoping that the Holy Spirit would use even the, the listening to this conversation as a way of renewing our own love for the Lord and mm. our love for his word. I, 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 I'm struck so much by mm. your um, description of yourself as just kind of this delight um, in, with, mm. with the word of God. And and maybe there's people who are listening who are saying, gosh, the Bible's become kind of old to me. It's become just this tool that I got at this text that I have to use. And mm. maybe mm. there's something here for you to pray for our listeners that mm. the Lord would renew our own love for his word and reveal himself in fresh ways mm. to us as mm. we do that. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I would be honored to pray, of course, <laughs> Glenn. Yeah. Father, um, have mercy on us. Um, would you, in that mercy, uh, open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word and in your instruction? Um, you know the story of every person uh, who's listening. Um, you are with them, around them, and in them, and uh, you know what they need today. And you know um, where they're hurting and where they're disappointed and where they are full of excitement and joy. Um, and just wherever each one of us is at right now, um, we want to encounter you in new ways. We want to see uh, the beauty and brilliance of Jesus. And um, we want to encounter you through the scriptures and through your word. So would you please just have mercy on us and bring in the people, the resources, the moments uh, that could reignite joy uh, in reading and sharing scripture with other people. So we know that you are merciful, Father, and we trust that you will give good gifts when we ask. So we do ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Tim. What a joy to talk yeah, to you. Yeah, Glenn. Yeah, likewise. Good to talk. Once again, thank you to our partners. World Vision cares deeply about this generation of emerging leaders that God is raising up for this season to mobilize his church. 
And that's why World Vision and Barna partnered, partnered for a very special webcast, Engaging Gen Z, why there's hope for the next generation and the church. You can get free access to the webcast today by going to worldvision.org slash resilient pod. That's worldvision.org slash resilient P-O-D. And a big thank you to Full Strength Network. Full Strength created a well-being membership specifically for pastors and ministry leaders. And so to get access to Full Strength's coaching and counseling experts, well-being resources, and more, go to fullstrength.org. Thanks again for listening, friends. May the grace of God be with you. The same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead renew your inner being today.